Okay, as I said before, this is beyond your rotator cuff exercise. It is not a rotator cuff program. The key points you want to get is that it should be 12 to 15 reps on each set. And you'll probably start off with one set with your players. Expand it up to two sets, that's enough. Don't just keep doing it. More isn't always better. You know, a couple of aspirin will help your headache. A whole bottle will kill you. So don't get too carried away with things. You've got to get the baseball. I'm not trying to get you going where you're going to spend 30 minutes stretching, 30 minutes on stretch cord, another 30 minutes on uh, throwing program, and then you don't get around to baseball. we got to get to baseball. We only have a limited amount of time. You only practice a very few number of days over here. So I'm trying to give you a program that will fit into that, and you go to it. Okay? you got to stress proper form, and I'll point out some stuff in here where the form isn't very good. Uh, we want explosive movement with balance. You'll see that we do, you'll start off on normal ground, but then I show you a balance board that you can do the exercises on. If you put your players in an unstable base and make them perform correctly, when they get back to a stable base in a the game, they should be even better. The core strength is stronger because it has to pick up the, the uh, control of the body. So put them on an unstable base as soon as you can. And as I said, Use the balance board as they advance. Now the balance board is about six feet plus in length. You know, 10 to 12 inches wide. Okay. Show you what it looks like here. There's nothing fancy. You can make this. It's not a matter. Just a board laid out. I painted it because it uh, looked prettier. It's not a big deal. So you can see that that looks pretty simple on top. On the bottom, this is how you make it a balance. Just bolt or nail, two by one along the middle, the full length. And you'll see when we get to doing the videos, they start off on ground. We'll show you some exercise on the balance board. You can do them all on that. But that type of instability will start helping your players get stronger with the core. Okay, first thing we're going to do is scap loads. I'm not going to go into the fundamentals of throwing and pitching. I'll let Mike do that. Uh, everybody teaches a little differently. But scap load happens. Whether you want to teach it or not, if you don't load, pinch your shoulder blades together to throw, then you're cutting out one of your power sources. I like this particular photo because from the top you can see the actual player with the scap loads, the elbows behind the shoulder line, and the shadow even emphasizes it even further. Okay, so this first, first set of exercises is a scap load. You want to pinch the shoulder blades together. It's not a matter of pulling out here. It's these muscles wrapped between the shoulder blades. The elbows are behind the shoulder line. And you can add rotation if you want, but pretty simple. Now you can also add rotation. Okay, that's up to you. That type of scap load. Turn the volume off because all they do is breathe heavy. <laughs> From the back view, got to get the elbows behind the shoulders. It's not here. They got to get behind the shoulder line. You can see the player behind him on the balance board. We'll get to the front. The front. You want to do what the dumbbells do without the. Or not. Yeah, you, you can do this. Yeah. We're just talking about setting up on a fence with a stretch cord for practice. This is not a separate workout. This is part of your practice. Okay? Trunk twisters. This type of rotation X factor is extremely important. You look at photograph after photograph, and you'll see how the jersey twists there. That shows how the hips are leading, the shoulders stay loaded. You have to get that type of rotation. And strength and quickness and power there. You rotate the shoulders and upper body, arms fully extended, and you want to keep the feet firmly planted. We don't want to start getting a lot of this. We're trying to get separation on this between the hips and the shoulders.
again, working the core muscles. We don't want them working the arms. The shoulders are going. Yeah. Jimmy, are you controlling your body as the recoil on the on the actual? Um, uh, now I'm not too concerned about this. It's the pull. Uh, I don't want to come back slow. This is explosive movement. Right. Okay. They they start off slow, and then they'll get faster. Now, I will point out one quick thing. See the guy on the back in the fence? If you don't have hip flexibility, you're limiting what you can do in throwing, whether it's pitching, outfield, whatever. And so we have them also on their time off doing some flexibility on the hips, okay? Trying to get them loose. You'd be surprised how stiff some of these kids get. Okay. You should have an outline. This is starting to irritate me. What do we get interference from? Okay. Okay. Positive butterflies. Any throwing action, you've got the front chest, the front of the arm working. Okay. I think about everybody has some type of butterfly uh, program in their lifting, whatever it may be. You want to arch the back. You want to see an arch in the small of the back. It's not starting with a flat back. You've got to get arched shoulders back behind the hips. Okay. You want to work the abs so it's stomach and then pull. It's not just this. Okay. Arch the back because when you start looking at Pitcher's throwing, you'll see that little arch of small the back right here. So we've got to get them in that position to start with. And you finish low. Again, the hands as far back as you can. Stretch it out. We're not talking about a lot of heavy load here. Now, this kid's one of the better players. He's one of the better junior players in Spain. But you see how he gets very little back arch? He needs to get a little more of a back arch in this. He's certainly strong. He's a big, strong kid. But we get, need to increase the range a little bit of the trunk muscles. Now, they, they didn't have much of a problem with that. It's this. We're having a tough time with computers here today. Okay, let's try it again. We put guys on balance boards. Now look how much more difficult it gets. And I'll show you several examples here. This kid had no trouble with this exercise on flat ground. You can see that when he gets to working here, all of a sudden the base, and he'll start limiting the lower body, he should pick that, rotate and pick that back heel up. But they'll keep the feet flat to try to get stability. So you make sure when you're working it that you let you get them the full motion. Rotate the heel over, and that is really difficult. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make this difficult. We want the game to be easy. If you practice easy, the game gets hard. But you can see how there's very little lower body action on this. So when you get the, that's the, the hip swing, uh, one thing, get the toe up on both of those on the hip swing. It's not this. It's toe up, toe up. We've got to get full hip work. Okay, we're struggling through this. Reverse butterflies. Again, we talked about the de-accelerators. Okay. He's got to go from 90 miles an hour to zero. These muscles have to make that happen. If they don't, then there's tear in the joints. So we've got to strengthen the back side. Start low. Uh, we just left the cords there in one spot for, for convenience sake. If you have a kind of has a clip on it, this, the clip should be down at the bottom. So when they pull back, that it's working up this way, or in a straight back. It's not real crucial. You want to arch your back. Again, we've got to work these muscles here in the small of the back. 
and you've got to finish with the hands behind the head and extend it. He does a pretty good job here. It's good arch. Arms extended. You'll see the guy on the other side. He tends to keep the elbows bent. Does more of a rotator cuff type exercise. That's cheating on it. We've got rotator cuff exercises. This is here. We're trying to work muscles back here. Again, let's see what happens when we put them on a balance board. I guarantee you, this, this kid can play in the United States, but look, look at his balance and his core strength. And he's a strong kid, but he hasn't trained in this. You have to understand, these kids have never done these exercises before. This was introduced to them this summer in a, a two-week academy. I filmed them in the middle of the second week. Okay, so you can see what a balance board does if you want your athletes to get even better. Positive airplanes. Very few people throw with the posture straight up and down. It's possible out here. You understand that arm angle is based on posture. Okay? And so when we're coming out from whether it's arm <coughs> angle up here or down here, our posture is slightly changed. And we have to have the strength to maintain that spine angle, whatever your posture is. If that's changing, then you run into real problems. So what we call positive airplanes, you want to maintain the shoulder arm relationship. And you'll see these kids, they'll cheat with it. There'll be a little bit of this instead of working the trunk. You understand we're working the core here. You obviously have to have strength to stabilize the cords out here. But we're working here. We've got rotator cuff and other exercises for the other joints. Shoulders stay square. In other words, don't let them they'll do this as they bend down. They'll, they'll turn twist the trunk. We want to keep this type of relationship as we do this. We don't want to do this with this. And you want to go as far as you can. That's not too bad. But you can see how I uh, like with these right arm. He lets the arm sink a little bit. But it's not, I wouldn't correct that too much. <clears throat> you, you see how the arms start changing relations to the shoulders with him? He's not getting a whole lot of trunk twisting. We're trying to get these type of strength going there. And he'll cheat down with it a little bit. No matter what program you have, if it's this or throwing, whatever it may be, you better be teaching and supervising, giving them feedback. You just let them go down and do it, then hard tell what's getting done. The negative airplanes, so now we're going to work the back side. Here we're working front, and we're going to turn around. Ugliest man in baseball. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, the ladies don't mind his paycheck. <laughs> okay, again, same type of principle. Maintain the shoulder arm relationship. Don't twist the trunk. We want to keep it on line. Bend as far as you can either way. This is a good, hard-working kid. His dad wants him to come to America to play. And hope he gets an academic scholarship. Try to get as much arch back as you can. From back, here's the guy that knows how to cheat on this. Same guy I showed you before. See how the hands drop down? You know, I'd rather the arms stay here, and that, that's as far as you can go. Don't drop the hand down by the side, but cheat. When you throw, there's a straight line relationship from shoulder, left shoulder clear out to the hand. It doesn't go here and here. So we want to duplicate that as best we can. Here you see he's not going very far. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look closely, we don't have the angle, but from the side you'll see him doing this a little bit. 
instead of staying on the line, he's kind of doing this. But if they get tired, this is how they're going to cheat on it. So I'm just showing you these. Oh, let's upgrade now. I'm tired of seeing you for a month. <laughs> Okay, throwing action. Now we're, we're actually going to go into using these joints a little bit more. We're still going to use the core muscles. Okay, but if you look at this throwing action from uh, gun side L, is what you call it? I call it flat L, he calls it gun side L, to release from here to here. is obviously a very crucial place that you need to protect your players so that they can be maximum effort without hurting themselves. You start in the torque position, or gun side L position. The hips open first. It's not this. The hips lead. You've got to get separation to create that tension. And you'll see it in photograph after photograph of pictures. You'll see this jersey twist across. If this is, there's no wrinkles here, you're doing it wrong. And how many young kids you see, when they start throwing, they do that. There's no separation. So the hips open. I want to set the glove. This is a teaching point for me. I have to do this. If it's here, I have to do this. I don't care where this is. Okay, like Mike talked about, it's elbow to elbow. But this has to happen. Okay, I've got to turn it over. Lead with the shoulders, elbow, forehand, hand last. It's a sequence, it's a linking system. And you finish low. Keeps a little too flat with the back heel. I can't believe you're using your hips if the heel stays down. If you're hitting, that back heel's down, there's no hips. If you're throwing, that heel stays It's got to come up and over. It's the only way the hips can turn. Again, this is not the perfect drill. I'm showing you what young kids will look like when you first start doing this. Then we go to reversed. Okay? Now we got to work the back side. We start the finish follow through position, we rotate back. So we're working front and back. <clears throat> Mechanically, he's trying to do the right things. Again, this uh, Oscar, I mean, he's a shortstop third baseman pitcher. He could play in American Junior College real easily. But again, he hasn't had much experience with this kind of stuff. Okay, let's. Uh, not responding. Now I'm going to put them on a balance board on this. I hope you get to see it. How he locks the back heel down to try to maintain balance. He's got to learn to do the correct motion on a balance board. He doesn't have any strength problems in the arms and hands, but the balance board really increases the difficulty. He's very mechanical. This is the first time they've done. You obviously want them to be more explosive and quicker, but again, he's worried about falling off the board and doing it correctly. We don't want to create robots. We don't want, you know, this type of motion. I can show you positions. You don't get in that position. You go through that position. Photograph after photograph shows you things, positions you go through, not positions you get to. Okay. Again, from the or the gun side L position to follow through, these muscles are stressed a lot. And you better be able to strengthen those and work. Negative thrust, you start with low, the attachment should be low on the ground in your follow through position, and then go back to here. And you finish in the torque or flat gun, uh, gun side L position. So he does a pretty good job here. He's getting more rotation with the back heel. Okay. But 
at some point we want to get more explosive. Right here we're working on form, technique, and some strength. Later on we want to see how fast we can do this without falling off the board. Because that's what you got to do. You've got to do this as fast as you can. We're not trying to make pretty pictures. We're trying to make velocity arms. I'm, I've come to the realization, and if I had a nickel for my past career coaching, the number of times I've yelled out of the dugout, God damn it, throw strikes, I'd be a very, very rich man. But I believe now you develop velocity first and control second. And we coach velocity out of kids by teaching control first. We certainly have to throw strikes. I'm not saying we don't. But we better be able to throw good strikes with good velocity and good movement. Otherwise, it does us no good. Doesn't any good to lose five mile an hour to throw in strike zone and say you can rip it. <coughs> Again, you just pretty simple. You can see how he cheats a little bit when he comes back. Instead of coming here, he cheat drops the elbow down and does more of a rotator cuff type exercise. Not a big deal. Like I said, I didn't want to overcoach these kids. See, there's no rotation on the back heel. Okay, now then, let's see if I can find a second one. Any questions on those? <coughs> yes? Now, you talk about just for pitching, but can all... I think they all should do it. Yeah. <coughs> now, what, what, uh, because I wasn't in charge of the camp, all the position players went down the other side, and they did the rotator cut stuff. And that, that's necessary. But, you know, that, that was the way it was. If I did it, I can't see any reason why every player on your team shouldn't have good throwing mechanics. So, I mean, you have to teach throwing. Pitching is throwing, okay? Pitching is throwing. And catching, if, if for years we taught catching throwing as some special little isolated thing over here. It's not. Catchers throw like everybody else. They're... Their arm action may be slightly different, but they still have to do the same fundamental things. And if you want stronger arms, I don't see why you have strong pitching arms and have a weak third baseman's arm. That makes sense to me. But that's your choice if you can do it. But that program doesn't take long. Those kids were done with that at the same time those guys finished the rotator cuff. Now we threw more with the pitchers. Okay, my belief is that when you start throwing, you better be teaching. <coughs> when I took the Czech national team to Taiwan in the World Cup back in the 90s, or I'm not sure when it was, oh, it's old blur anymore, but scouts commented, because we started off on one knee warming up every for every game, and one scout said, you know, there's 30, 28 teams at that time in the Major League, nobody warms up like that. Yeah, well, if I'm coaching a Major League team, I wouldn't warm up like that either. I'm working with Czech junior players that we're still trying to teach them basic fundamentals. I know they're on the national team. You're doing the same thing. If you don't take a throwing program, okay, here we go again. <laughs> Let's see, view, fit the window, good idea. Okay. I think it's a learning opportunity, uh, as I told some guys before, uh, in coaching, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And you're going to get criticized for not coaching enough. Why don't you teach them anything? And you're going to get criticized, well, you're over teaching. You're teaching them too much. I determined early in my career, I'm going to be damned for doing. I, I tend to overcoach. <coughs> French coaches found that out. Okay? I, I do that because I think it's a game is a learning opportunity and it's time to teach, time to teach. And it doesn't make it the right philosophy, but that's my philosophy. So I start teaching right away. Pre-throwing warm-up, Mike talked a little bit about it. I think I stole some of this from him anyhow years ago. Uh, the circles, clockwise, counterclockwise, standing circles. Don't, don't let them go behind the shoulder, okay? Everything's in front of the shoulder on this, on the circles. Forward saws, just this type of action, so I'm working. Cross-body saws here. Shrugs, just loosen up these, and then slap downs or slap ups, whichever way you want to call it. I want them going fast both ways. Okay. And again, how long does that take? <laughs> no, it doesn't take hardly anything. I start off now on two knees because I'm trying to get separation. I want them to get separation between the shoulders and the hips. 
real important. If you're going to create velocity, you have to get separation. You have to create what they call the X factor. Whether you're hitting or throwing, you want separation between the hips and the shoulders. And the more separation you can get, the more power you build up. And you have to learn to release that with accuracy. Okay? Uh, probably a good example of the X factor, Tiger Woods has the biggest separation of shoulders and hips in his swing. He since shortened it some, because he doesn't need all of it, but he used to have more separation between hips and shoulders to top his backswing than the other pro golfers. Okay? And then he releases that energy. Okay, so that's what we're trying to get here. Maximum shoulder rotation. Do not let them do this. You're wasting your time. They've got to get the shoulders working. Get on the far, I want you to watch him every once in a while. I'm going to slow him down from behind later. He's the strongest, best athlete of any of them there. He does the weighted ball exercises that we'll show you later, no problem. But you'll see that blue tape. I'm not sure what all that tape does on the elbow. But all he could do was a warm up. He never did to a very long extended toss. But I'll show you why. It's a technique problem. Pretty simple. Uh, Guys steal the little cones I use for agility drills to put their knees on and stuff. Let them, uh, some guys get the long pants, pull them down. They all bitch about their sore knees on this. This is short distance. We don't stay very long in this. We move right along. Gunslinger. I don't know how we got this. But we start here. We're square. And I want the elbows to lead the hands. Uh, I think the elbows have to lead in throwing. If the hands lead, we get long and sometimes out of position. If I, my elbows and shoulders go, the hands will follow in the correct position. If my hands go, hard to tell them where I'm going to be coming out of. Okay? I want the heels up on rotation. Here to here. Okay? We call it gun because you're kind of squared off. We want shoulder and hip rotation. Now we start adding the hips in. You'll see the kid begin, the same kid on the far side, he cheats a little bit, does a rotation, and it doesn't matter. But the main thing is, let's lead with the elbows. See how the elbows go and the hands fall? That's enough. Heels come up, rotate over. We back up a little further on this. They're doing it nice and slow, that's fine, like I said, we're... They're in a learning mode here, first time they've seen this stuff. Now, from the spread position, the stride position, we're talking about elbows opposite and equal, straight across. We want somewhat of a spine tilt. I'm a believer in spine tilt. To listen, Tom House, he stack and go. I like spine tilt. I think this adds another element to it. We're going to get a little more velocity thrown from here as opposed to from here. Okay. Forearm options. If I'm throwing, I can start here. I can start here. Or I can even start here. I don't care. You'll find players coming from different positions. Here, I've got to come here. Makes me pick it up. Here, I'm already in that position. If you've got a player that's having trouble getting from here to here, in other words, he gets back here and got slings, then put him in this position. So he has to pick it up, back of the hand up, back of the forearm up, and throw. Okay. Uh, I used to care about whether they followed through or they just turned the page with the back foot. I don't care about that anymore. As long as the heel comes up, if the heel stays down and they drag, If they do this, I'm worried, okay, because I haven't released this. I want to see the heel come up and either stay there or heel come up and follow through. I don't care. That heel has to come up so that I know this happened. See the kid on the far side? Watch his follow through. We're throwing easy. We're not a very long distance here. 
That's not bad, but watch his next one. They probably did two here. See the spinning tilt? Good. I guess it's the third one. Anyhow, we'll get to him in a minute. We're, we only throw maybe eight to ten tosses at each one of these, okay? We're not spending a lot of time on it. We're moving through. Elbow rock. Again, this fits in with my philosophy of throwing. If it doesn't fit in with yours, don't use it. <clears throat> but I want elbow rock. We rock one, two, three, and throw. Okay, from the spread position. Now, if you got a good athlete, let's cross behind and rock and throw. But it takes a little more being able to walk down the street and shoot down at the same time coordination. Okay? One rock, three elbows. The third rock must duplicate the first two. This is what you'll see when you start, start them off on this. I go one, look where my elbow is, two, three. And they'll cut it off. And you have to tell them, don't be in a hurry to throw. Don't be in a hurry. Let that third one get here and throw. Why? Because you've got to get the elbow up to throw. I don't care. I've got pictures of uh, submarine pitchers. They get here to come back to here. They don't get here and throw. You've got to get the third elbow's got to be up full. And we want late rotation. You don't want early rotation in throwing. So take your time. When I'm actually throwing, I don't want to unload here early. I want to stay strong. I want to stay sideways. I want to stay loaded. So don't be in a hurry to throw on that third one. Now you'll watch, this kid isn't bad. I had some that were worse. But I want you to notice where his elbow comes to. Mark it on that fence back there, that hotel, and watch his third one. And he's not bad. You cross over. It's not glove to glove, okay? We want them to cross over. I don't care which hand's in front. It doesn't matter. But see how quicker, how much quicker he turns the elbow over on the third one? Watch the kid on the far side. He didn't get to the tires in the car on the third one, and the first two are at the top of the fence. Okay? So you got to police this thing. Get it here and then throw it. And boom, clear it out the tire, turns it over. Make this way. I don't know why it punishes me like this. I well, every time I go to a new country, I try to learn the words, at least body parts and directions. But I can tell you right now, Codos Primero uh, Mano Segundo in Spanish. Is, I, I've said that so many times I can say it in my sleep. But it's elbows first, hands second. If you're going hands first, you can be done. Okay, uh, how many of you guys have actually watched uh, what's Linskin's first name for the Giants? For Tim? Tim, Tim Linskin? I mean, you look at that, that guy's all screwed up. I mean, he gets down in here, but I'll guarantee you, from right here, it comes right here to pick up. He does not go behind his back, behind the body. It goes here, and he picks it up, and this hand is in front of that elbow. It does not go back here. I wouldn't teach that, but he gets the right spot. Okay, cross behind. This is where we start extending our toss. We're going to cross behind. I do not like to cross in front because it opens my hips. I want to stay sideways, loaded, and closed as long as I can. So we cross behind, and we take this out to long toss. Long toss is different for every person. This is the stretch out phase. We do the stretch out phase every day. Go as far as you can. I want, and I don't, I don't care what the line is. I'm not going to overcoach that. I do care about arm action, <clears throat> okay, and this is where you start losing a lot of mechanics because when they throw harder, all of a sudden you see them doing this. I'll put a, I'll put a baseball on the kid's head and say, okay, throw that ball. I said, what do you mean? I can't throw it. I said, well, you're trying to do it when you throw. You're trying to throw your head, okay? So, watch mechanics, stretch out face every day. 
And that's different. Some guys go way out, some not so far. Some days your arm doesn't feel so good, so you don't go as far. <clears throat> okay? There's no hard, fast rule on this. I want to stretch it out. The pull-down phase on designated days, maybe once a week in the season. Pull-downs where I'm at 300 feet, if that's my longest distance in my dreams, and I'm throwing maximum velocity. And I come back in 10 steps, and I'm still throwing like I'm at 300 feet. I come in 10 steps. I throw two to three each spot, and I'm still throwing like I'm back out there at the fence. And I come down to 60, 70 feet eventually, and I'm still trying to throw like I was at the fence. That's your pull-down phase. Okay, that's an overload. You can't do that every day. But you do the stretch-out phase every day. You can incorporate a weighted ball program with this. Use a 7-ounce uh, or 10-ounce ball. Some guys like it. They may not go all the way out to 300 feet with a weighted ball. Watch them. Don't let them get out so far that now they're slinging and using bad mechanics. But some guys like to do it. They'll even use the underload ball, the 4-ounce ball. Baseball is 5 ounces. Go 4-ounce ball. They'll use a lighter ball so the arm goes faster. That's fine. Okay? In season, out of season, it really matters where you are in the year on how much of the overload, underload, and the pull-down phase you use. Off-season, two, three times a week, probably. Again, you, as they start throwing longer, you see them start not getting as high with the elbows. They'll start cutting it off here. They've got to really emphasize getting up. I'm not about to put these guys up as examples. There's a reason Marl's bringing in pictures from Latin America. Okay? I have no argument with that. But if you don't have a program to develop these kids that's already in place for when the talent comes along, then you'll be important players forever. At some point, you've got to develop your own people. Don't get me going on that. We'll it's a whole other session. But we're into the import business here in Europe now. Happy feet, you know, don't just, we got to pick things up, okay? You want to do things quicker, you got to practice quicker. And again, we go a long ways out on this. Some people like at a certain point, they like to square them up, step in front, and get the turn here. That's fine. These guys, uh, we weren't ready for that. Okay. Problems may occur when the complexity of the drill starts. On two knees, you should be able to do pretty good technique. All you got to do is work on getting elbows leading and shoulder rotate. Okay. If they on two knees, if they fall after they throw and catch themselves, that's okay. I don't want them so careful that they don't fall and we don't get any type of real rotation separation. As you start throwing harder, your technique problems start breaking down. That's when you've got to really police it. They've got to learn to throw with good technique at high velocity. But you may have to back it up. We learn slow, but you better practice fast. Once they've got it, we need to speed it up, speed it up, and then you'll get to a point that's too fast. Okay? You'll get to points too fast. As you throw longer distance, you'll start seeing mechanics breaking down. As you get outside distractions, if you've got... Uh, Six people in the stands or 60,000, you'll see the difference in technique. When I, uh, first year I coached the Czech Nash, Czechoslovakian national team, we came to Ladenburg for the B pool championships. Back then, only one B pool team got to go up. Who knows there? And we went undefeated. We, we fell right. We got the right British pitching rotation in the semis. I mean, everybody knows it's been a tournament. It's pretty much luck on how the rotation comes out. We're undefeated. We're playing Germany for championship. The place is packed. There, you know, stands for about 60 people. They're down, they're behind their dugout, they're down the fence. I mean, it's crazy. I don't know if the Germans knew what they were watching, but boy, it was loud. It was soccer mentality, football mentality crowd. We had a, uh, a, a, a pregame program that had extra throwing in it. Had a lot of coaches come up to me in the tournament and ask what we did because the checks don't throw enough. And I can tell you right now, Belgian French guys don't throw enough. So I added throwing in, extra throwing in, in our pregame. And it looked good. It was fast. Our guys got good at it. We practiced all summer on it. We get partway through the pregame with all this noise and distraction. They couldn't remember the pregame. I mean, it was so, done so good up until then, people wanted to adopt it. 
Now we couldn't finish it. I finally had to, okay, let's go. Let's get off the field. One coach said, that's okay, Jim, they'll relax the bear. I said, no, it's going to get worse. And it did. They double figured us pretty bad. So outside distractions will affect performance and technique, okay? And as they get tired, they start making mistakes. And yet, your pitcher better be in late, in his 70th, 80th, 90th, 100th pitch, his technique better be even better than it was when he was fresh because there's more of a chance of injury. And obviously, if a bad technique and he's tired, he's got real problems. Okay. This is the kid I was telling you about. The best athlete, strongest. I told him if he didn't make some changes, he's going to be one of the best DHs in Spain. But you can see the tape on his elbow. I'm going to slow it down here in a minute. But I want you, I, I don't think, I, I, about the only thing I'll do with pitchers is I might drop their arm angle. But I don't mess with arm angle. But I do teach arm action. I want you to understand the difference between arm angle is this angle out here, you release that. Arm action is what is the arm, when the hand leaves the glove to a release, what does the arm do? That's arm action. What path does it take? Okay, now. Let's see. Like I said, this is filmed with this right here. And it's, it's not all the bells and whistles you'll see on these other guys. But I can stop it. Frame by frame. There's no blurring. You can see what he's doing. Pretty good there. Everything's loaded. He's getting good pelvic load, staying closed, got the foot underneath the knee, all the things we teach. That's pretty good. Now he goes starting home. Now, right here, separation. He's doing a pretty good job leading with the elbow. See how the elbows are separating? I want to see distance gain there. But now we start running into problems. Right here. The hand will keep going behind the elbow. See the hand behind the elbow? You put your pitcher in this position and tell him to throw the ball. And he's going to have to do this. And it puts a tremendous amount of strain on the arm. Okay? Tremendous amount of strain. That if he doesn't change this arm action, he will always have a sore arm. Okay? See the, see the head and shoulders dumping now? And a lot of strain. All of a sudden, he had to change his posture to get it through. And this is a shame. Like I said, when I show you the weighted ball programs, no problem. Well, he doesn't have any trouble with it. I think for 80 bucks, that's as close analysis as you need. I can show you hitting, films, and, and we slow it down frame by frame. You don't need to spend a lot of money to show your players what they're doing. I mean, when he looked at this, he couldn't believe it. And yet, you watch him do the drills, he was doing pretty good. But now we're out longer distance. Now the technique's breaking down. Okay, overload. In order to get stronger if you're in a weight program, you have to overload the muscles. Otherwise, you won't get stronger. If you want to maintain strength, just do the same uh, weight, and that will maintain your strength. If you want the arm to handle a heavier load, you have to overload it. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, Jim talked about the softball. Softball is a good overload. It weighs a little more than a baseball. has more resistance. Okay? Two knees. I think when we do the two knee drill, we just do it for warm-up. But if I have a team and I'm practicing, my team needs to be able to do from two knees the distance of their bases. So if you got juveniles and little league, they should be able to throw 60 feet from the two knees. And I mean throw with velocity and control. That's overload. I can't use any of my lower body. I have to use just shoulders and my arm. So that's an overload. I don't have the help down here. By increasing the distance on two knees, you're doing overload. Long toss. The pull-down phase is overload. Pitchers don't throw from 300 feet. Why do you get them out there throwing? We're overloading the arm. So when he works back to 60 feet, 
he can throw that same velocity. It's overload. Weighted ball programs, and we won't have time to get into all that. I think most of it, the weight of the ball can be two ounces over. It can be six, seven ounces over. Some people will throw with a three-pound ball. I'll show you some other ball, uh, weighted ball exercises. We don't do a lot of long throwing with it, but we'll do some of those drills that Jim talked about. The distance of your throw, the longer you throw a weighted ball, the more power it takes. The number of throws, if you increase the volume, most weighted ball programs, as the second, third, fourth, sixth week, you're making more tosses with the weighted balls than you did when you first started. Okay? And you can combine the overweight and underweight. Underweight ball, it's lighter, less resistant. The arm can actually move faster. Fast switch muscles get a little more work. So there's a lot of ways to overload. Okay? All right, I'm going to show you something that I think is important in throwing, and then I'm going to leave it to the other experts. But this is something I kind of got. I don't like the changes because I don't know what I did. Uh, <coughs> the more I started looking at throwing action and what it takes to throw with velocity, I The arm action. I've got I've got a lot of photos, people. If anybody <laughs> wants to copy them while I'm here, you're more than happy to, uh, to do it off the stick. But something I started. Let's see if I can find it now. Okay, here, here's one real quick example. This kid just coming out of uh, out of uh, Las Vegas throws 100 miles an hour. One, look at his face and see what the intent is. He's not trying to fool anybody here or throw a cute little curveball on the outside corner. <laughs> his intent is velocity. 100 miles an hour. Look at the relationship of the elbow, hand, and shoulder. Elbows are behind the shoulder, but the hand is in front of the elbow. It does not get behind. He's a long ways out here, and he's still loaded. Late rotation is really, really important. The hips rotate late, and the shoulders rotate even later. But you've got to store up, and it takes a lot of strength, a lot of strength from here to here to maintain all that load. If you're weak in here, you have to rotate back here, and you're throwing 60 feet instead of <coughs> throwing 50 feet. But this type of action, I'm beginning to think more and more, that arm action has to be here. If they get out here, they're in trouble. <laughs> That are in trouble. Jim. Yeah. It, it's a great picture of if you look at his back heel, he's already started to rotate that back heel up, even though his shoulders are locked and loaded. That's exactly. a great picture. It, like I said, may, may, maybe it's over coaching, but I, I can tell you that I just, I really believe that arm action can be taught. And I also believe that there are some arm actions that are better. Okay, you guys haven't seen this guy. If you haven't seen him, you watch the motion, it gets really weird. You see where he's down? He kind of sticks it in the mud. He gets, definitely gets spine tilt, doesn't he? But I can tell you, from right here, he picks it up. Look, see how far that hand is behind his back? Look how long he's staying loaded. Nothing's unloaded yet. The toes barely starting to open. The shoulders are still lined up over at the dugout. Jim. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You didn't like to look at me, Michelle. You wouldn't teach this, okay? His dad's adamant. He wouldn't let any coach ever change it. And he's probably right. He's in the major leagues and he's one of the best. You wouldn't teach this because he's got to get out of this, but he does. But again, you see how it has the spine tilt, the shoulder turn, the hips are barely starting to open. Now, when he picks it up, you see this elbow leading and the hand here. You don't see the hand back underneath. 
again, he's still loaded. He gets to here. Look at the elbow hand relationship. This is strong. This is weak, awkward. And he, he really delays rotation. And that's why you'll see him fly off to the side. I don't think he's going to throw you some cute little curveball on the outside. Now, posture. See how you draw this line. Straight line. He throws up here. He does it with posture. He comes late, rotates late, but he's rotating around this spine angle there. So if you want him to throw hard, don't let him reach back here for more. That's my lesson because it can hurt. And follow through. Explosive. Like I said, there's more than one way to play this game. There's more than one way to get here. But they all have to get there. Okay. I apologize for the delay and the confusion with computers. Uh, one system wouldn't talk to the other. I don't know that. Any questions on the stretch quarter throwing program? I ran through it pretty quick because we were behind. <coughs> Jim, what's your uh, philosophy regarding core work uh, doing, uh, using med balls instead of... Uh... I'll cover that, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, show you the, I'll show you a modified program we do every day and then an extended program we do all season. Hey, the old funny stories. Have you ever looked at those old videos, those guys back in the old days, and they got this medicine ball, leather medicine ball, they're throwing around circles. And people laugh, oh, that's funny looking. Hey, we're going back to that now. <laughs> you know, we're back to that. And it shouldn't be a surprise in Europe. I think you all have been far ahead of the United States in training. Baseball, they thought they were trick athletes or something. And we, we just did not apply fundamentals to what they should have been performing as a, I want to make my pitchers better athletes. And we've coached the athleticism out of them. Oh, boy, that's pretty balanced break. Oh, man, that's good looking smooth. He can throw forever like that. Yeah, except he's getting ripped. Let's get the ball going there. The faster the arm, I got drills that we work to speed the arm up, not slow the lower body down. Let's go and let's speed the arm up, make the arm catch up. Faster arm. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Is there any place for static stretching programs? In a uh, from what I read, okay, uh, uh, we went into static stretching really heavy yeah. in the past, and they started finding out you know that actually increases injuries. Yeah. I completely <laughs> agree, but a lot of a lot of baseball programs they get this static stretching program in, and it's sort of like tradition. Yeah. You're going to sit there and, and stretch. Your what I read, the cool down static stretching is about the only place for it. Few Dynamic stretch. We got to move. Uh, I'll let Mike talk in a minute. The hip exercise I talked about on the fence, just have him grab a fence or wall and then swing here and swing up and around, toe up as high as they can. And the other exercise I do is simply lay down and I have them here, here. Rotate around, here, up and down. You've got to free up the hips, and you do it with motion. We used to, okay, just cross over and hold, hold, but now mo put motion in your stretch. It might be probably much more advanced on this. We, um, I was a big static stretching guy. I ran track. Years ago, I had a friend of mine that was a big corporate fitness guy who was really into this stuff, and he explained it to me more physiologically. Bottom line was, baseball is played with fast twitch and super fast twitch muscle fibers. So you want to have actions that are going to exemplify the movements you make in the game. And so you're a lot better off, like Jim's talking about, doing motion exercises that activate those muscle fibers through a range of motion that they're going to use in the skill. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So the warm-up throwing, the warm-up drills, the, even the stretch cords are part of the stretching yeah. as they're building the exactly. muscle strength. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to hurt yourself with these type of exercises, and it gets the body ready to play baseball. And so use it as part of it. Jim, we're from all different types of age groups coaching and stuff. What's the, uh, so like, uh, you know, age limits on some of these drills? I mean, I've got kids in T-ball that can't throw, you know, 20 feet, and I'm going to do some knee exercise. Is that a good thing to teach them to throw 
location of the needs, or is that more for the more advanced kids? That no, I, I think I, the, the first kids come around, start them off on need. One, we can teach this because that's all they got to worry about. It simplifies the motion so they can concentrate on this upper body and shoulder and arm action to get it correct before. If you just have them start playing catch and talking, then they're doing the complete move. I believe in teaching in parts and putting it together. Uh, so the throwing program, yeah, how far out they go, you know, from this will depend on their age and arm strength. You may have two kids that only go out from here to the here in the room, whereas some of the other kids on your team might be going the extended distance. But I don't see any reason to specialize uh, by age. And stretch cords, you know, that, that's, that stretch cord's probably too young for T-ball. You've you got to get them playing the game. But once they get up to get at age, I think they should be doing stretch cord <coughs> and dumbbell stuff and learning to, that there's things they can do to make themselves better athletes, not just better baseball players. Well, if you don't mind, I want to add something to the, uh, the pitching thing where regarding, uh, for example, the guy with the, uh, when he's too long in the back. Uh, what I experienced through the years is if you just look at pitchers, and you, for example, you look to uh, to the shortstops. Shortstops, probably your best athlete on your team. So, if you ever seen a shortstop throwing like that to first base? No, I don't think so. Did you ever ask yourself the question, why isn't the shortstop having that problem, and my pitcher is having that problem? So, the main the main thing is that pitchers have too much time. Pitchers have too much time to think, and what, what we all teach, and, and Jim said, like, what we did in the past is the is this type of thing, and I go, a lot of coaches go, like, one, two, three, and then we have those drills that we have to wait, and the pitcher will hand the ball out here, or pitcher, uh, pitching coach will hand the ball right there, and now we're going. So we're slowing down our motion. If we slow down our motion, we're going to have a lot of time that uh, fundamentally errors in our uh, bad mechanics will get into our uh, throwing bush. So what I found out is, is just a slightly change of their back foot. And what we all teach pitchers is that this back foot has to be on the rubber this way. So right now we can throw it that way. But if you play catch, if, if I play catch with somebody out there, I'll never play catch like this and throw. It's human, it's natural, if we throw, we play catch, everybody in the world is playing catch. It's going to be slightly turned this foot in, and now we're throwing. That will get us, the body, our motion, this momentum going that way. So now, this is natural, this is human, and we're teaching our pitchers to be right here. This will stop your movement going that way. Right now, this pitcher has all time of the world to do everything wrong in here. Because this body is to, is came to a complete stop. So by turning this foot a little bit, and what one guy can be a little bit farther, just turning a little bit, now his bat, his his weight is on the inside part of his leg, on the inside part of his feet. Right now, the entire body wants to go that way. Right now, the muscle memory, the uh, right here, says like, hey, you got it catch up right here because you won't be in time right there. So by just changing this foot, uh, this uh, feet posture a little bit, you can uh, solve this arm problem. It can. And if you, if you add, for example, if you add a screen and you let it start right here, you throw it right now. I can, my pitch is going to start right here and I can throw without a problem. It's hard as you want. But this kid, like Jim said, if, they, if my foot is right here, I can do it. I can do it. But if I change it a little bit, I can go as hard as I want to do. Okay? So just by, and, and I was talking with, uh, with Mark a little earlier, everybody in here, we all see mistakes in hitting or, 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 or fielding or hitting or whatever. And that will, but might be the error uh, in the uh, mechanic might be much earlier than uh, the final, uh, the final uh, product, the final reserve. If in the beginning of your mechanic by movement, 
you make an error this big at the end of the road, at the end of the uh, of the movement, it might be that big of an error. So by the little things, might solve problems. So if you have a guy who has this problem, you might try to change his foot angle on the rubber. Okay, I'm not just going to say that this thing will solve all our problems. That's not true, but it might help you. That's a good point. I like that. If we used to teach, because we could see best the follow through, whether it's hitting or throwing. You know, and, and they used to, oh, when you follow through, you pick up grass, you know, you got to be able to follow through in a good feeling position. Well, if you got a pitcher feeling, finishing a good feeling position, he better be a good feeler, because he didn't get much into the throw. If you're throwing, throwing a lot of velocity, you've got to get here and recover. Okay, and I, I saw a lot of pitchers that could indicate where you need to back up to. What's the problem here? Now, I'll also tell you, and Mike, I'm going to turn over to Mike here after a break, but you better get here in time, and you better get here in time. And there's a lot of different ways of doing it, and we've got to coordinate a lot of different body parts to do it. But you've got to, if you're behind, you've got to find out a way to get all the links performing in the right sequence and firing quickly in the right sequence at the right time. A technique problem or a timing problem or a talent problem. Some guys are not going to be able to do it. Okay, uh, we fell behind, but uh, to be honest, we had an extra slot there. And I appreciate the input from these guys. Uh, let's take a little bit of a break. It's pretty warm in here. Get some liquid. And then we'll get back going in about 10 minutes. Great.